Now it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce this wonderful man who has done lots for the pill community, the current pumpkin and my co-worker, Sawyer. This was awesome. We roped Abigail for this. It's great. <laughs> All right. So, hi everyone. Thank you for coming. And, yeah, no, I think that's big enough, so thank you for that. Uh, I, I'm really bad with titles. And it's even worse when Stephen Little is sitting next to me, egging me on, and go like, no, no, just add more words. So, uh, I'd like to explain my title. I can only explain half of it. Uh, there's a TV show that I really like called Futurama. How many people like Futurama? Uh, isn't it great? It's great. So, yeah, there's uh, an episode with cats. How many people love cats? Okay, yeah, yeah. There's like an episode where they take over the earth and, and make humans do everything they want, which is basically what happens now. And there's just like a, the way they call earth, because they don't come from earth, the way they call earth is blue, blue, shiny ball. So I thought it was funny and I added it in and somehow more words get attached. So it's just, this is basically an apology. Because you've been reading this, you've been read, uh, reading this and you've been thinking, oh, this would be interesting. It isn't, I'm sorry. Uh, now, uh, uh, this should be the title, right? It should be 526. And I would have begun here, but I, I want to do something else before we begin. So, in this past year, we have lost two friends, John and Kip. And in P5P, which is short for Pearl 5 Porters, which is the group that maintains and develops Pearl 5, we have a tradition of noting lost friends and colleagues. And I think it is only appropriate to do so in this talk as well. And in 526, we have also noted the departure of John and Kip. Following this, I'd like to start. So, the first thing I was thinking about when I was preparing this talk is who actually made 526. Because there were a lot of people who made it. People think I put a lot of effort. I put a lot of effort, I think, but I don't actually write most of the code, do most of the fixes and stuff like that. Very rarely, I mostly help other people do it, which is most of my job. There is an announcement every time we release a new version. And that announcement includes a lot of details, such as the changes and who made them. And the part on who made them, we use a script to accomplish. So this is me running the script. It's from a directory in the Perl source code called porting, which is basically a set of utilities for us, the Perl 5 porters. And this one provides us with all the acknowledgments from one tag to the other. Every release is tagged, and that's how I'm able to add to the announcement that information. And if you run this script, if you just clone the Perl 5 git repo, and you go into this directory and run it, you'll get this beautiful list. These are everyone that was involved. And a few of them are with us now. And I'd like to say thank you, because you gave us 526. <laughs> if you are not on this list, um, highlighted, but you are here, please let me know, and I do apologize. So the next question, after we know who made 526, what is in 526? And I get this asked all the time. This is the first release that I made. And I've been asked all the time, like, what is really in it? Like, what stuff do you have there? And it's hard for me to answer this because we've done a, uh, various things and I keep trying to find the one thing that makes this release unique. Because every release has something about it. Every release has like, oh, it's that release in which they did this and they added that thing or they broke that other thing. That's, and what did I break? So I was trying to answer this. So I looked over at the previous releases to understand what did they do. So let's talk about 5.20. We added subroutine signatures. That was a really big thing. We have changed them since, but that was the first introduction of them. And while some languages have had it since the 70s, hey, we stepped up. So we added them. That's great. We have the new slice syntax. I really like that. We added the postfix deref. I love the postfix deref. It's really cool. So you write something, and instead of wrapping the entire thing with a dereference, you just put an arrow to continue forward. The character you would have put for a deref and just a star, and you're done. And then you continue to write forward. It's really nice. And we added Unicode 6.3. We removed CGI PM from core. I, I have. <laughs> 
For those that are not familiar with why this is personally big for me, there's this rant that this fool gave at previous conferences and workshops and talked about killing CGIPM and eventually was able to announce that it was indeed removed. This is the post from P5P saying, all right, we're, that's it, it's gone. It's still on CPAN, so we'll miss you, but like not really. Where is Lee? Is Lee here? He's at the conference. Yeah. Oh well. No? Where, where, where? In the back? Yes. No, of course. So on CPAN, <laughs> Lee is maintaining it. No. Now, <laughs> now, that was nice of you, but I, I owe you an apology because you're not maintaining. You basically made enough things to not touch it ever again. So, thank you for that, okay. So, that was great, 520, okay, we covered one pearl, let's continue. 522, 522, we added new bitwise operators, we added the double diamond, every time you use the diamond, switch it to double diamond moving forward. Just trust me on this, okay? Security issue, it's better, just do that. But we introduced it, it's great. It was, by the way, Rafael Garcia Suarez, a colleague of mine, he was in charge of 510, previous pumpkin, uh, an amazing person, and here are the double diamond. We had the new Unicode word boundaries. If you work in Unicode, if you work in other languages other than English, which here is actually much more common, then we have new word boundaries, and that was Carl Williamson. And we have the N modifier for regular expressions that turns off, so you don't have captures, so like no captures, and then you don't have to put the question mark and the colon to basically say, okay, but not this, but not this, but not this, but not this, and if you've seen um, if you've seen Damien's talk, where he had all of those in there to speed a few things up and change a few things, we now have this for the entire regular expression, which is pretty cool. We added strict mode for regular expressions. We have Unicode 7, alias by reference, which if you know what it is, isn't it awesome? But if you don't, don't worry about it. The const subroutine attributes and the multi dereference operator. And I really like the multi deref operator so much that I'm going to talk about it for one moment. So the easiest thing for me to explain is by example how this works. And I'll just say the op, a lot of people don't know this, but Perl actually has a compilation phase, a complete compilation phase in which it analyzes the code, creates a tree of operations, which we call ops, and then the runner comes in and starts running through those operations. So actually it does compile. Now it doesn't have to compile everything. There are some things that it allows for late compilation and it has really nice, uh, interesting dynamic options, but it does have a compilation phase that also has constant folding and stuff like that. And the multi deref op does the following things. So let's play with, with this idea. So let's say that there's a C and there is also the bottom of the C because this is a reverse index and there's a hole in the bottom of the C, and there's a log in the hole in the bottom of the C, and there's a branch in the log in the hole in the bottom of the C, and there's, well, obviously, there's a bump on the branch on the log in the hole in the bottom of the C. And there's a frog on the bump on the branch on the log in the hole in the bottom of the C, which has a tail. So there's a tail on the frog, on the bump, on the branch, on the log, in the hole, in the bottom of the C, which has a speck on it. So there's a speck on the tail, on the frog, on the bump, on the branch, on the log, in the hole, in the bottom of the C. And there's a fleck on the speck, on the tail, on the frog, on the bump, on the branch, on the log, in the hole, in the bottom of the C. Now, all of these are operations. When you run this code, and maybe you do, <laughs> Perl has to analyze this, compile it, and decide on all the operations it will have to do. And the operations will be to go to the first thing, dereference it, go to the next thing, dereference that, then go to the next thing. And you can see that we don't actually have to put the arrows for all these dereferencing, because Perl basically says, well, there aren't any other options once you drill down that. So you just can remove the arrow for dereferencing. But it will eventually look like this. Now, before you gasp and worry, I'm going to eliminate the unnecessary parts. Much better. And these are all the operations. You can see here that there's a hash element, there's an RV to HV that says take a reference value and turn it into a hash value so I can access it, as in dereference this reference as a hash. And then it continues on and accesses another hash element and then an array element, and it continues and continues and continues and continues and continues. Now, 
the multi DRF op basically says, well, maybe if I do this in one operation, it would be faster. Surprise, surprise, it really is. This is how it looks like in 522 with a multi DRF op. Now, I'll eliminate the unnecessary parts as I did before. That's it. Isn't this nice? This is also considerably faster. So it's really nice. Uh, and thank you for Dave Mitchell for doing this. All right, so we reached 524, right? OK, what do we have in 524? The postfix DRF that I talked about is actually in. We're good. It's in, and we can use it. And it's no longer experimental, which is great. The audit DRF thing was removed. It was problematic. And it had, let's say, subtleties in how people use it, how it acted, contexts, weird stuff like that. And eventually, it was a misfeature. So it was removed. The lexical topical variable was removed as well. In most cases, when people use it, it wasn't on purpose. And it didn't do what they thought it did. So that's mostly how users interact with software once you put it out there. And we realized that interaction was not in their favor. So we removed it. And a feature is not necessarily good to have if no one uses it correctly, because maybe it wasn't clear and maybe it wasn't useful. So that's a change that I think was a good idea. Unicode 8 is in. I like Unicode 8. I'm going to talk about it in a sec. Some more word boundaries. And the context stack rework, which is really cool, because it sounds just not that interesting. But Dave Mitchell went ahead and changed how the stack works whenever you go into a subroutine and exit a subroutine and create a context and exit that. And that entire thing was reworked from scratch. It broke a bunch of stuff that we had to fix. But at the end of it, all of your subroutines are 30% faster. And you tend to use subroutines, right? Yeah, sure. That's really nice, right? That's pretty cool. All right. So now I want to talk about Unicode 8. Unicode 8 was big, in my opinion, because it included a few things that you think are very important for people. This is an example of some code that I showed in previous talks in the past. It uses 524. We're using the full character names for Unicode elements. And what you can see here that we have a what's called a zero width joiner, which is basically a way to concatenate things together in Unicode, but without any width to them. So it creates one character of them. There is a heavy black heart, which is a heart shape, but it is by default black. And there's a concatenation to a variation selector. Does anyone know what variation selector 16 is? I, two people. No. OK, you can go ahead. OK, is, it, is this a guess? Is this? No, are you guessing? No, I know. OK, so it tells it to use a different font. No, use a different version of the thing. A different version of the thing. OK, well, that is correct. It does use a different version of it. It selects a variation of it. Does anyone know what this will actually create? Context here matters. <laughs> Daxim, you're, I, I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. It's a, the one that comes afterwards. Yes, it is a different color. So it will, it will take this character and it will add a shade, a different color to this. This will make the heart red. By just concatenating these two things in Unicode, you've just created one single character in Unicode of a red heart. Isn't it awesome? But it gets better. We can take another character, and we can take another character, and we can then join them together using a character that says, hey, join all of these together, but I don't want there to be space in between. I don't want width in between them. And that's the zero width joiner, which is what we're doing at the last line. I don't know if you can all see this, but it says print join zero width joiner, which is the first line there, and a woman, and a heart, and a kiss, and another woman. And this will create one single character in Unicode, one of all of these put together, and the heart will be red. The problem is that I can never show this natively because my terminal is not as up to date as Perl. My terminal doesn't support it, it doesn't know how to do that. My Firefox doesn't know how to do that. My Chrome doesn't know how to do that. I don't have a piece of software on my machine that supports Unicode as well as Perl 5.
However, I have retrieved from the internet what it would look like. So you can see it. And this is really nice because you can join different characters. Right? Give gave uh, an example of this, uh, Rick, and he used two men. I used two women because we wanted to show the diversity of being able to take different people that you usually do not see in Unicode or usually do not see is just a, you know, the normative thing. And you have all of this. It matters. It matters a lot. But the fact that you can create one character in Unicode out of all of this programmatically, it's so amazing. It also adds a diversity system, which I think is even more important. There's the Fitzpatrick scale for skin tones, and they used it, and just like we used these to take a shade for the uh, heart and make it red, you could give people skin tones, because no one is really yellow, okay? And we have different shades, okay? And these shades are very important because they're a representation of who we really are. And you can give people their actual color, their actual being, their, their identity. And I think it's very crucial when we have representations of people on the computer. And that's also one of the reasons why having Unicode characters for women as women is incredibly important. Because you look at something to find yourself in it. If all the characters that we have are yellow or white or men versus women, then some of us are really not there. It could be half of us, it could be more of us. So it's not like one person in the entire population that just doesn't identify with Unicode, you know? It's very important. This is an example of using a similar idea. I basically just stuck all of this together. And what you can see is that I used the zero, uh, the zero width joiner in the beginning, and then I just add a bunch of stuff. So I have concatenated here without a dot, just put it in the same string, because Pro will do interpolation. And I've added a woman and a skin tone. And I've added the heart and a variation. I've added the kiss mark. I've added another woman, a different skin tone. And you can create these. And you can represent people the way they are. And I think that's really, really, really neat. So yeah, I, I, my topic was not this. It was supposed to be 526. So now I will delve into 526. Someone whispered finally. Thank you. OK. So there are a few things in 5.26.2. None of this I have done, none of this I was involved with, but now I can talk about stuff that I've done. So far, it's just giving others credit. So let's talk about the big stuff and specifically adding. The add ink is an array with all of the directories that Perl will look for new modules in. And it's a bit more complicated. It could have code drafts and stuff like that, but let's just leave it a list of, li uh, list of directories. And every time you want to load a module, it will look through that list of directories to see if the module is there. The only problem is that the last line used to be dot. And dot means here, where I am right now. And we decide to remove it. And you would think, ah, how much damage could that make? <laughs> so, okay. Let's just cover it shortly. Beforehand, it looked like this, maybe. We had a path and another, another. And at the end, the dot was there. And now we removed it, and it looks like this. We didn't touch our other directories, but we did remove dot. And there was a very good reason for it, security. And none of us were happy with it, because it kind of shook CPAN a little bit. And it took us a long time to figure out how to do this well. We had to patch back 5.22 and 5.24. And we had to talk to numerous distributions that share Perl and have Perl, like Active State that have Active Perl, like Strawberry Perl, like Apple. I had to send emails to Apple. Um, but all of these distributions on Linux. And we had to coordinate fixing existing versions because Dot was there. And we realized this is such an important thing that we also need to actively remove it from existing versions rather than just remove it from uh, dot in, uh, the dot ink in 526. For 524 and all of those, we didn't really remove dot. We mostly patched as much as we could because otherwise we would really break stuff. But it was a really important thing. And I think that if you were affected by this, we really are sorry. But we put a lot of effort into making something that, well, you might not be affected by this. Someone else might be. And it could be really problematic for them. And worse, they might not know about it. And I think it's very important that while some of us were incredibly unhappy about it, 
This affected real people. And this affected one of the main operating systems. And they had an active problem. So people here were likely affected and not know. And maybe you weren't and you weren't happy about it, but you know what? We're a community. We're trying to help as many people. So take the hit, you know? So, okay, what's the hit? Uh, well, Perl still works. Check. CPAN is not on fire. Double check. There was a lot of work by the tool chain that were able to fix CPAN to the state where mostly everything works under testing due to this. So really good work to uh, a lot of props to the CPAN tool chain. And there's a, stuff, a, lot of, a bunch of stuff that you could do to alleviate any errors that you find, any problems that you find. So I'm going to list them. If you suffer from this, please refer to these ideas. These are also mentioned in the 526 release notes. And, um, and if you're not, you don't need to worry. So first, you can add dot to ink manually. During the begin block, which is at compilation, you can change to a certain directory, and you can add dot to ink. You can also add dot to ink locally in a scope when you really need it, and then patch whatever really needed it later on. So you basically create a scope, you add it locally using local, and then you run whatever action you need a dot for, and as soon as you're out, you're done. There are additional things you could do if things fail during testing or during runtime. There are also ways to control Perl itself. Currently, it recognizes the environment variable Perl use unsafe ink. And we explicitly called it unsafe ink. If you turn this on, Perl will add dot back in for that runtime. I do not suggest putting this on and leaving the room. As in like, I'm done and now we can continue without changing anything because really we will remove this at some point. We don't want you to be able to do this, but this is a shame for you. Just like that, you can also configure it with dash u that says undefine the following variable during the configuration of Pro. And the variable is called default ink excludes dot. Naming is really hard. That's the best we could do. So the dash uppercase u says, no, 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 I don't want to include dot. And then your Pro will have dot. Also, bear in mind, we will remove this in the future. So fix your stuff. Now, you can also call use lib dot, and then, hey, you have dot in ink. Ta da Although, it will appear at the beginning, which is actually better, because it avoids some of the subtleties of that security problem. And you can also run do with dot slash, and that will work too. Now, there is one, one really nice thing that we did, and uh, thank you for Matt for this. Uh, Matt Trout has suggested it. Now, if you do this, call do, and then just give a file, because it actually uses ink, add ink underneath, and most of us like, had no idea, this won't work anymore, but it will give you a very nice warning saying, hey, this failed, but it would have worked if we had dot, because I checked, and that actually exists there. I'm not gonna load it, but you should know it did work. How about you change it to dot, uh, dot slash, and they will work just fine. So if you see this, do what the computer asks. So uh, various people were involved with this. I do want to give a thank you to uh, John Lightsey and Todd Rinaldo. They're here. Tony Cook put a lot of effort. Leon Timmermans, Karen Etheridge, Kent Frederick, Graham Knopp, Aristotle, uh, Pagalitz. Uh, I'm really bad with pronouncing this name. But Aristotle, everyone knows him. And uh, thank you. There's also possibly, where's Jeffrey? I don't look at him directly. Uh, there's possibly a lightning talk that Todd Rinaldo will give just about this. So we'll see. All right, so let's move on. We also added indented here docs. Who wanted indented here docs? Wow, that's great. I didn't know so many people knew of this. That's great. Who doesn't know what this is? Because you're going to join a club with a lot of other people. All right, so I'm going to explain what this is, and then you're going to go, damn it. <laughs> I wish we had this, and now we do. So this is a common pattern I have. I have a function called 
help and exit. So it prints help and then it exits. And the first thing that I give it is an optional message. So maybe I want to give a specific error that happened, print the error, then print the help, then exit. It's very useful. So I'll say, hey, if there's a message, I want you to print it. And regardless, print the help. And this is a here doc, right? Cool. But what's the problem with this? Well, there's a bunch of spaces. Jace is going, <laughs> which is nice. It's good. So I get it. you got to move it back. So if I would do this, it would all be indented in the output. So I have to move it back. And I always make this mistake. And then what's the next problem? Well, I'm going to put the end help. But no, no, no. That also has to go there. And how many people have actually put in the terminator for the here doc with spaces in the quotes so you could put it at spaces? Like, OK, right? Yeah. OK, so you move it back. But now let's take this here doc character. And let's put this there, the tilde at the end. Now it looks like this. Carl Williamson calls it a here doc with a twist. <laughs> and now we can do this. And we can do this. Finally. So this started because Matthew Horsfall, who's also a core dev, he was playing with a few ideas, and he sent an email saying, so I understand this was raised in the past, and people said it couldn't be done. I have a patch here, and as far as I know, it works. What did I miss? Did I get something wrong? Is there an edge case I don't know about? Is there a clear obvious? And people respond with, uh, yeah, that seems to work. All right. So yeah, we now have this. So hey, cool. All right, more stuff. More st Does anyone want more stuff? Are we done? No, more stuff. OK. All right, OK. So we did add more stuff. So Unicode 9. Unicode 9, I really like this. Um, Unicode 9 added a particular emoji that I was waiting a long time for. People were really happy because it also added whiskey and I think it was, I don't remember what else. It has a bunch of those things. And I'm not excited about this. I don't drink at all. But it did add one thing that I do have an addiction for, which is avocado. <laughs> and, thank you. That's applause for avocado. Yeah, totally. Um, I am wearing my Avocado Addicts Anonymous shirt. Um, so, okay. So, it added an avocado. Now, one thing that it did, which as far as I know is the first time in history that it added a character. And then it added another character just to help you confront people who, when you're excited about the first character, are not that excited. So, if you say, hey, there's avocado, and they go like, eh. You now have a face palm. You can respond appropriately and show your discontent with their non-excitement about avocado. OK. Jokes aside, though, Unicode 9 actually added a few things that are really important for people. The following are languages that were added. These languages, for those that are non-historic, are still languages that are used, written, spoken by people who live on Earth with us. They're used by them. They're used by people who research them. And now, additionally, historical scripts. They're also studied. And now they don't need pictures for it. They can actually express it properly. And it's funny. I always think back about this. My first language is Hebrew. And I speak it like, eh. But I know how to use the characters and write. And it was supported really, really early. Right? I was able to use Hebrew when writing very early. But there's a bunch of people who can't up until now. I'm going to tell Unicode 9 added them. They're not able to express themselves online except using someone else's language, which to me is really foreign. Because when I talk to my parents and we text, I use Hebrew because that's what they prefer. And there are people who cannot do this, <laughs> right? But now they're able to. So this, these are probably more important than the face palm. I'm not sure if avocado. <laughs> Just kidding. It is. It is more important. So it's really nice. It's really cool. OK. But we do have Unicode 9 support. OK, but that's, that's not all we did. So let's talk about some more stuff. Version control markers are now recognized. And they're not just recognized when you run and it goes, uh, I don't know what this is. Uh, you know what? I'll just show you an example. You'll get what I mean. I have pre-written the script. And this script has a function. And the function has indicators for a merge here that failed, one from head with an old boring message Sad. And the other one with a new message, and it's awesome, and it's tremendous. And I give this to uh, Yapsi and I thought it was very appropriate. So <laughs> I got a chuckle. It's good. OK. So um, 
Now, what happens if you run this? Does anyone know? Can anyone guess at which point it will fail and why? I'm going to save the trial. I know no one's going to raise their hand, although I appreciate giving me the benefit of the doubt that someone might. This is what's going to happen. You're going to run this, and it trails a little bit, but basically it says, hey, uh, you have a bare here doc terminator character, and I think you meant that one, and it's deprecated, but then you have another one, and then you have another one where it just can't find the terminator. This is fantastic. And none of us, like very few of us, really understand what it wants from us or how to fix it. Fun fact, I worked at a company that uh, was using PHP for their web app, and I was doing sysadmin in Perl, and they used to ask me for help in random things, and some of them were programming. And I remember going up to them once when they asked for help, and they were kind of panicking, there was something wrong on the website. And we opened the website, and there were a bunch of spaces, so all the website was crunched down, and then there, were, there was a less me character, and then there was underneath it another less me character, and there were four of those and everything was crunched together. They had no idea why that happened. And you open up the source code, and somewhere in between, those characters appear. About 10, 20, 30 times. What happened was they tried to merge a really old branch with a lot of changes in it against their master branch. There was a conflict, and they said, eh. <laughs> Someone literally had the official answer, eh. And they just added it, committed it, rolled it out, and that was it. So, yeah, um, struggle is real. Um, okay, now, uh, what happens if you run it now in 5.26? Well, Pro 5.26 is going to say, hey, hey, you have a conflict marker, version control conflict marker on the script at this line. And I couldn't execute it. And I don't know if you can see the uh, sentence at the end, but I'll tell you what it is. Execution on myscript.pl aborted due to compilation error, which means that Perl didn't even try to run this. It didn't even try. It read it, it tried to compile it, and it said, nope, not going to continue. You have a problem. So this is fantastic. I really like this. And if GCC can have it, why can't we? OK. We added more stuff. Yeah, geez, we did. So we added captured data variables. They came in fairly late, kind of on a whim. but. They worked really well. So let's talk about what they do. If I have a string like this, and I'll take three characters and capture each one separately using these parentheses. I get $1, $2, $3, right? And $1, $2, $3 are not really good variable names. So what I will do is copy them over to proper variable names, foo, bar, buzz, because they're the best, during presentations. And there's another way to do this. I could just assign it when I do that. That would also work. It's very useful. But then what happens if I want to check whether I receive them and how many? I start doing checks. So if I don't have this, or if I don't have this, or if I don't have this, which is a way to verify they, I want to know they have all three. Uh, I could also write it this way. This is usually how I would write it. I would say this and this and this, or, and it's very important to notice the precedence of each, but don't worry about it. Uh, what happens if, say, one of them is optional? Uh, there's a question mark there for C. I don't know if you can see that. It's a question mark. It says, well, maybe there isn't C, because I'm, I'm okay if there isn't C. But then I need to still get that, and then I still need to have a default, right? Or I could also check it this way. So, yeah, uh, this, is, this is tricky. So, okay. What we have now is once you run a regex, you also have the at and hat capture. And what this gives you is an array of all of the capture variables. That's it. And you could just assign from that. You can also check it directly. It's really cool. And this will check whether you had a capture. It's very nice. We also have the hash hat capture. We also have the hash, or the percentage, hat capture all, which are equivalent to the percent plus, percent minus. And if you don't know what those are, eh, it's fine. You don't need to know. Oh, I forgot. No, we did add another thing. Yeah, We also had the double X. And there was a suggestion. Is Brian Defoy here? So he suggested maybe triple X. Like, what would triple X be? Because Brian, I don't know. I don't know if that's, I, I, don't, I don't know if. Um, it's like, well, it could be. No, no, no. It's like, well, it could be Amsterdam. I was like, yeah, I would love to, but I don't know if I'm allowed to add additional stuff just for where I live. So let's talk about double X before we talk about triple X. 
So this is a regular expression. We've all seen this. And it has uh, character classes. So it's d to e, g to i, 3 to 7. This is another one. And it says one of the following characters. It's not a range. And those are hard to read. But hey, Pro 5, Pro in general, has always been leading in regular expressions. So we have the x, and we will add it. Way more readable now. <laughs> But what we now have is double X, and that says, you know what, character classes, if you have double X, that also means that any spaces in it are ignored. Because otherwise, the space there would mean a literal space. Now it isn't. So now you can expand those, and you can clearly see this means D to E, G to I, 3 to 7. And you can also expand those. And that is more readable. That's pretty cool. All right, more stuff, right? More stuff? More stuff. OK, more stuff. Uh, script extensions. Does anyone know what script extensions are? So it used to be script, and then we changed to script extensions, which are actually more accurate for almost everything. So things are more accurate now. Let's say that. In Unicode scripts, they're more accurate now because you're using script extensions. Although you can't specific, specify which script it is you still want, so you can ask for the original script. If you don't know what this is, don't worry about it. Or if you're interested, hey, you can go to Perl Unicode and read the part that says scripts. And we'll explain this. It's pretty cool. All right, we changed a few more things. The unescaped left brace in regex. So this, has anyone seen this warning? All right, cool. So we did this, sorry. All right, so what was the reason? You see, these left braces, now you can see this because I took this from the Vim coloring. And Vim is really good at saying, hey, that slash D you have braces there, but I can really tell that those are not a quantity. Those just are braces. They're literal braces. But if you didn't have this, you would go, wait, slash D and then braces with nothing in them? Does that mean zero? Does that mean any at all? Does that mean none? Does this mean optional? What does that mean? And it basically says, well, there's no quantifier there. I guess it's literal and stuff like that. And we really want to also use that, uh, those braces even more. So what we're going to do is clean that up. If you want something literal, you really need to put in a slash in front of it. If it's a character that means something in regex, then you can't just use it to mean something else, right? So just like any other character in regex, if it's a special character like the brace, and you want to use it literally, please put that backslash in. So we did that. You can just put that there. There are two exceptions that I'm going to show you, and then you won't remember, and you will just put backslashes on it. Deal? OK. Two exceptions, if it's at the beginning or in the beginning after a or condition. Both of those cases, you will likely have a harder time remembering than just backslash. So agreed? Agreed. I got one. OK, good. All right, uh, referencing to a variable. So I like this. We added the ref alias in and now declared refs. So you could have done this, where you took one variable and then created an alias of another variable, which means that they are now the same variable. They're not a reference to a variable. They are exactly the same variable, which means that if you change foo and you change bar, hey, you change each other. Now we can also put that, that backslash on the variable itself, which helps in clarity a bit. I like this. We changed the scalar, uh, the return signature for scalar hash. So this is a common mistake that I make. You have a hash here, and I have pre-populated a hash with all of these elements. 1 to 300, which will basically say 1, 2, 3, 4, which will mean pairs. So 1 to 2, 3 to 4, 5 to 6. And I have accidentally assigned, instead of the keys of the hash, I've assigned the hash to a scalar. Now, I'm not sure how many people know what this will print out, but let's do a short quiz. How many people say it will be 300 as in the number of characters, the number of elements in the hash? How many people say it's going to be, it's just going to print 300? Okay, okay, good. How many people say it's going to be uh, 150 because of the number of keys? Because there are 150 keys. Okay, cool. How many people are going to say it's going to be 150 because there are 150 Values. No, no one's raising their hand. No one's taking guesses, or maybe just everyone knows. Okay, so how many people say it's going to be 150 because that's the number of pairs? Okay. <laughs> Tough audience. 
How many people just don't know and don't ask me? Okay, good, okay, good, okay. We're communicating, it's fine, it's good. All I want is communication, okay. So, right, so okay, what of those, right? I printed it, this is what I got. Yep. So. <laughs> I was waiting for that one. <laughs> David Adler knew the result. <laughs> So now you look at this and you go, oh, of course, 118 slash 256. That's the string I was looking for. Because it's a string. Right, so now 518 added hash randomization, which means that just start the program again, you might get a different lucky number. So we changed that. And now what it will do is literally be 150 because that's the number of keys. And that's probably what you wanted. The other number actually talked about the bucketing there, and it wasn't really helpful even for those who did knew, who do know what that is. So it, it also, you can use that. So, all right, so now it's just 150. It's also like way faster. Cool. We fixed a few things. Let's talk about them. So uh, we say goodbye to Usenet in the documentation. I'm sorry. POSIX, uh, POSIX temp name was removed. So it was deprecated to 5.22, so we finally removed it. There's file temp and other stuff that are way better. Please use them. The dollar hat encoding was removed. There is filter encoding if you're doing this, or encoding PM has filter if you're doing this, or please don't do this. Cool. Next, um, right. So you used to be able to do require and then two colons at the beginning, and then like, uh, okay, we fixed that. We did break something in uh, 518, so when you had foo and bar together with colons in between them as one string, uh, sorry, as, yeah, as one string, it would uh, do foo and then colon, colon, and then bar, and now it's just foo, colon, colon, and then bar. If you haven't been bitten by this, it's solely cool. Type globs, star, uh, type globs that have a name, star, I'm, I'm going to read it out. A type glob that has a name, star, colon, 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 used to be broken. You're going to have, you're going to have that type glob. So if anyone was waiting for this, you're good. You're good. I mean, I know, right? It's worth the conference. All right. <laughs> we tried to make a few things faster, so let's talk about that. We made subroutine signatures really fast, which is great. They are now as fast, they're comparable in speed to not using them, which is already a really big plus because it includes additional steps, but now it's as fast. We do have plans to make them even faster than not using them, which is really cool because then you're going to have a really good reason to use them. Look, boss, I don't, I don't want to write nice Perl. I have to because it's fast. <laughs> we have a, a new and a faster hash function on 624, uh, on 64-bit. Uh, Read line is faster, which is good, because we use it. Assignment to arrays or hashes on the left-hand side are also faster. If you have a single digit number, and it's a string, and you want to convert it to an actual number, that is much faster now, and that actually happens far more than people know. And the bare word constant strings are now constant folded. So I guess the question is, what is 526 known for, right? Because that's what I've been trying to answer, just so it could tell you what we have in it. So this is what I'm hoping it will be known for. It had a safer add ink. It added Unicode 9. It had indented here docs. It had captured data variables. It recognized version control markers during compilation. It had the double X. It had the Unicode script extensions by default, so they are more accurate. Faster subroutine signatures, and you can start using them and be really happy about it. And it added a few more fixes and many more optimizations. Now, given that I'm not done, because I was given time, and I will talk until my slides are over. So, a few more things. We started doing hackathons, which is pretty cool. Uh, Todd Rinaldo and myself have been organizing Pro 5 Core hackathons. I say hackathons in plural because in October we're going to have our second one, which is great, because we're bringing in a bunch of core devs, people who have been working on Pro 5, and some of them have never met each other before. 
which is really spectacular. And they're getting together in a room or two and hack and spend time discussing things. And this is one example. Ruth was talking about all of these qualities that people, you know, I, I, there's something that really bugs me where people talk about development as like just a single skill of writing lines of code where we've, we already know how code works. We can write code to do stuff. And it might be hard, and it might be subtle, and there might be some uh, things that we need to do with it. But the really tricky things are not the code anymore. They're how to do this with a large amount of users, people, how to coordinate with others, how to manage different concerns. And the first two days, or three days, Nick might remember more, Abigail might remember more, we have spent on talking. And we've brought all these people from the US, cPanel sent a bunch of amazing people, and we brought people from England and from Germany and all over, and we're just sitting and talking. Because it was that important, and it was that difficult to do. One of the things that we did do were all the deprecations that we did that I would give a lightning talk about. That took one entire day to go through and several meetings during that day. And we did it. So I'm really happy about this. And in October, we're going to have our second meeting, which is fantastic. I'm going to hope, uh, hopefully, I will share a, a blog post about it later once we're done. So let's talk about future 527. We now have delete on key and value slices. Commonless, uh, I'm sorry. They're removed. Delete on key value slices are removed. These are things that we're removing. That was, oh, that was added. Wait. Those were added. This was removed. Whew. Mixed my side. OK. Those were added. But we did remove using commonless variable lists in formats. Uh, Tux is the only one using formats nowadays. So yeah. OK. Um, yeah, they were deprecated since 5. <laughs> See. It's, yeah, it's too early. See, one of the things that, like, when I say this is, this is difficult, this is what I mean. Like, we're saying, hey, how about we remove this thing since it was deprecated for a very, very long time. And we're like, wait, we need time to process this. And at least in formats, we can just ask Tux, hey, uh, do you need this? And he goes, no. It's like, OK, gone. So <laughs> it's good. OK. We removed the locked and unique attributes. They have been a no ops in 512. They didn't even do anything. You can write as many as you want. <laughs> the empty backslash n is now illegal because it doesn't mean anything. It's probably a mistake. My favorite one, Abigail touched on this as well, and I love this so much. The bare here doc terminator string. So yeah, this was subtle. This was, I understood this, and then I had to re-understand this because it's so confusing. So when you put a here doc terminator, when you put the, these two characters, and you're saying, well, now I want a word, and then just take everything until you see that word again. That works. That's, that works just fine. And you can quote that word to say, what kind of quoting do you want on this? If you don't put anything, then it's a double quote. But you could put a single quote. You could put a double quote explicitly, that's what I do. But what you could do in the past as well was not have anything there. Now you can have an empty quote. If you put an empty quote, it means I want an empty line. I want one line in which you just don't see anything. But you could also just not put anything at all. And it would still work. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't a good idea, so uh, a person, ah, what was it? I don't remember the first name, last name, I think it was Mr. Wall. <laughs> he deprecated it himself in version five. This, by the way, was a mega thread on whether we can remove it. Yes, so Ilmari points out, thank you, Ilmari. Um, he points out, well, this actually was in the way because of the here doc terminator. So we were trying to implement the here doc terminator, Matthew implemented it and said, hey, I picked the uh, less than, less than, and then dash, because it's used somewhere, uses dash. Other languages have this, and some of them use dash, some of them use tilde, and it went with dash. The problem is that Perl was like, oh, wait, 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 this dash is not about that, so it's probably an empty here doc terminator, what's called a bare here doc terminator, and it was this warning. So he couldn't do this. So we're like, oh, well, let's just remove the bare here doc warning, and wow. All hell broke loose, we cannot. So we eventually went with the tilde. Some languages use tilde, I believe Ruby does. And we said, OK, then we're going to go with the tilde, and we're going to remove it, because we're that hardcore. OK. So hash keys are now limited to two gigabytes. 
if you have a hash key <laughs> that goes above two gigs, who has ever used a hash key that is above two gigs? Don't raise your hand, trick question. It was never supported. Uh, but now we know we have a limitation for it, explicit one. Uh, we're working on getting the code points over this to uh, just in string one operations to uh, string bitwise operations to not work anymore. There's a trick used that uh, actually makes uh, abuse of this feature, and now we're removing it. So there's kind of play there to make sure we're not breaking it, and we might provide something better for that specific trick. We're talking about subroutine uh, signature speed, hoping probably. Let's see what Dave does and how much time he has. We added Travis CI now. Hey, that's kind of cool, right? Yeah, so we have that. 527.2 was the latest development release. We release one every month. And it was released by yours truly, Aaron Crane, right here in the front. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> and if you would like to also thank Aaron, I will give you his email and number. But another way would be to run this program. So Perl comes with this program called Perl Thanks. And if you run it, you can write some stuff, and it will send a lovely email to the mailing list for all the core developers to read. It is public, but hey, now you're this cool person who said thank you to a project you like. So feel free to do that. We really love seeing those. All right, so now I finished talking about 526, which is good, because now I can get to my real talk. So I have a talk in mind that I really wanted to do, and I used the 526 as the title, and how all this content is just a prelude, right? So my talk that I really want to give is uh, you and Perl. If you're interested in contributing to Perl, we have a lot of openings. We need a lot of help. You can reach us at Perl5Porters. This is our mailing list, Perl5-Porters at Perl.org. The mailing list is very polite. We have a standard of conduct that we adhere to, and we are very serious about this, because we want an environment in which you can work and you will enjoy what you do. But if you don't want to read it because it has a lot of traffic, you can also find the summaries. And the summaries are there to just give you a quick glance of what happened the last week. And they come out every week. Every week there's a new summary. You can either check my blog that I put it on, or you can just join the Pro5 summary list. It's one email a week at most, or the Twitter feed for that, and then you get a link to the blog post. And it includes all of the things that happened last week that I think are worthy of sharing. So news, fixes, new tickets, and maybe you see something there that you think is interesting. A little bit about the behavior that we expect, demand, and in turn try to provide you with. Diversity and inclusivity, these are different things. They're both important. To be welcoming, to be friendly, to be cooperative. More hands on deck, that helps. More people, more eyes, more hands, more skills, more abilities, better code, better documentation, better testing, bigger community. And all of these are achieved by providing an environment in which you just want to be there. And we get all these things. So yeah, these are the benefits of being nice. This took me a while to learn. So uh, I'm supposed to end uh, talks with quotes. So I picked several because, I mean, why limit yourself to only one? Peter Drucker said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. So this is my encouragement for all of us to create a better future. And there's a way to do this. And I think my guideline in this is, um, I'm hoping that someone at some point told someone else this, that we should really make each other proud. And someone once said, you should behave in the way your dog sees you. Because your dog sees you as the best person in the world. Try to live up to that. Try to live up to your dog or your companion if it's not a dog. And Abraham Lincoln said, be excellent to each other. And we should be. Of course, he said it from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Uh, it wasn't real Abraham Lincoln, but it still counts. So I'm still going to quote him on that because it looked like him. And that is my talk. I'd like to thank you very, very much for your patience and for being here and for being who you are. Thank you. Now, 
Thank you. Now, I don't know if we have extra time. Does anyone know if we do? We got like five minutes. Okay, about up to five minutes. Does anyone have any questions they would like to ask? Oh. Thank you, Nick. Does the slash XX option on regular expressions let you put comments in your character? Class? No, that is a very good question. The XX will not allow you to put comments in a character class, the brackets. That is an idea that we had. Currently doesn't. But the, there was a problem, yeah, and you can't put new lines either. So it's just for explicit spaces. But that might be what triple X could mean. <laughs> like, no, like really, really, really spacing. <laughs> Each X is for really. Or imagine some other word that you would like to put an X instead of the word. Uh, does anyone have any one, uh, one or two more questions? Feel free. Yeah, I don't know if it's related to the version, but uh, if you have a label inside a loop and you do the go to the label, it's deprecated for some versions. I will have to look into this. Okay, is it already? I can half, ah. I can half remember the answer to this. Now, um, I think it was because the co it looked like it would be better possible to make better code gen if you didn't jump into a loop because there, the actual implementation of for loops has three or four different versions. So if you do an iteration over an array, it doesn't copy it onto the stack. If you iterate over a range of numbers like 3.5, dot, dot it will store a sort of internal generator for that. And if you iterate over anything else it doesn't recognize, it puts a temporary list on the stack. Which means if you go to into a loop, you have to figure out what the hell was the type of the loop from at least those three and possibly some others we had ideas for. And almost no one does that, but the possibilities of optimizing the others seemed more useful. But then nobody made an optimization, so I think the deprecation was removed again. This is from memory. <laughs> See, this is the great thing about having the core devs here, because they, uh, they've touched the code, they've seen the code, they understand the history. I'm sorry, go ahead, Aaron. Uh, it is quite crashy, so it might get deprecated again. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I'm happy, I'm happy other people are here to help. Um, yes? Um, how am I supposed to get at the number of buckets and uh, how much of them are filled uh, from 526 up? So, so, yeah, so, yeah, there is hash util that will give you information about that. Um, yeah, and then, and then you will, uh, well, I'll just add, what, would you like to? Yeah, then you get them as actual separate numbers instead of a string you have to parse. Yeah. I mean, because what's better than a number? A string. Parse it yourself. Okay. So, no. <laughs> it's something that will still give you sensible answers or a sensible interface if you switch in a hash implementation for which buckets don't exist, which you can do now. There you go. Thank you very much, Hugo. You okay. may. Uh, Mark no, Keating been, would like to... I've been speaking with my Lego minifigures, and uh, the little yellow guys are upset that you don't think they exist. <laughs> but the Duplo guys are glad they're represented because they already came in lots of different colours. So thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Can I get away with I haven't seen the movie? Or is that a different crime? Lego minifigures. Oh, your own Lego My own mini Lego mini I have a Lego army, and I, they're no, coming I, for you. I heard about that. I, yeah, they're coming for you There's a rumor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're good. Thank you very much. Have a great conference. <laughs>